Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our guest this week, Michelle Guida from Under the Woolen Willow. Hi, Michelle. How are you, Gary? I'm going to be okay. I think so. Yes. <laughs> Good. This is fun because this is the first time I've talked about wool applique with anyone. So Excellent. I am most anxious to learn about how this all gets done. Good. So you might have a new a new um, stitching, some new stitching goodness to add to your right your your toolbox. Right, because the list is not very long, and I need something. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched Fiber Talk. I know you're not telling me the truth right now. <laughs> no, no. But it's most fascinating to me. So um, that's not where you started, though. Is that it? where no. did you start with your needlework world? No, what I really wanted to be was I wanted to be a quilter. When you grew um, up? When I grew up, I wanted to be a quilter. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I, I actually did do, let me back up. In When I was in college, a little bit before college, I did do needlework. I grew up, my mom constantly had, um, she was constantly doing crafts. She was constantly learning new things. And I was always kind of dabbling on the edges of whatever she was doing. So I did do things like cross stitch and needlepoint in that. Um, and then when I went away to college, I was still doing it. And then when I came back at home, got married, had some kids, I kind of stopped after my daughter was born doing that kind of needlework stuff. In fact, I I think the very last thing that I did in cross stitch was um, like a birth announcement for her. And then when she was born, I, I was working in corporate childcare at the time and I knew that I wanted to not have to go back there with her. Mm -hmm. So I opened my own um, craft shop where I kind of took in other crafters. They rented space from me. It was kind of like a co-op, but I was the only wait, one working whoa, whoa, there. Whoa, wait, back up, back up the truck. So wait, that's cool stuff right there. So you, you started a, you started a business just for crafters. Yes. So it was a, it was a storefront and I local crafters who lived in, in the area that I lived in would rent spaces in my shop. And I was the person who ran the shop and wrote them a check every month. And um, so I started off, I had about 15 crafters and artisans. And when we ended up closing, uh, the store was open for 10 years. Um, I, I had 80 different crafters and a couple of different wholesale accounts. Um, and then, then I, you know, went to a place where they handed me a paycheck every two weeks, I, you know, <laughs> finished my teaching degree and got a teaching job yeah. and ended up closing down the store. But so they um, did they was it a place for them to sell or did yes. they come in and actually make stuff? Uh, we did both. They sold their finished items and we also ran classes. So we had classes in um, I had somebody come and teach quilting classes. I had somebody come and teach uh, rug hooking. Uh, we did um, like toll painting classes. And this was all the crafters would come in and they would teach the class. I would organize everything. Um, and, and we did, I did that for 10 years, which so, was basically about the time that my daughter, um, you know, she grew up in the store. She came with <laughs> me every day. So, um, yeah. And then when she was in uh, fourth grade, which is 10 years old, I got a full-time teaching job. So, yeah. Well, that's pretty neat, though, because 10 years, that means you were at least paying the bills. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, we did very well. In fact, we moved the shop three times, and each time grew bigger and bigger, where at the end, I had bought an old uh, brick schoolhouse building and moved it How into fitting. there. So we had, <laughs> yeah, we had two floors, and um, it was really... It was really nice, and it, and it totally suited the purpose and the time of my life, and I loved it. And, of course, I sold my own finished crafts, and I think that's where I really, you know, like I said, I wanted to be a quilter, but I found that quilting was way too picky and precise and exact <laughs> for me. And every time I would go into a quilt shop, I would some quilt shops carried wool and did wool applique or had like very primitive kind of quilts that, you know, the points didn't meet up and the seams weren't perfect. And I thought, Oh, that's for me. I really <laughs> like that. So I, I got much more into that. Um, and the, the rest is kind of history. And then it wasn't until about two years ago 
Um, I watch Anna, Anna Bates, who runs, she has two different YouTube channels. One is um, Quilt Roadies, and that's how I first learned of her. And she does a lot of wool applique, so that's why I was watching her. And about two years ago, she... Um, she started another YouTube channel, uh, the Floss Tube channel, which she calls Stitch Roadies, because two years ago she wandered into Acorns and Threads, and she fell down that rabbit hole. And then she introduced all of her, you know, her listeners to that. And I dove in hook, line, and sinker again back into cross stitch after being away from it for about 25 years. And it is a whole new world out there. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and so I've just fallen in love with the designers and all of the new, um, you know, the, the fabric and the flosses that are out there now. So now I'm, you know, equally into cross stitch as much as the wool applique, but yeah. you know, if I had to choose, I'd have a really hard time choosing between the two. So it's interesting to me. So it basically making things has been your life. Yes. I mean, it, it, yes. Maybe a short period of here or there where it, it took a back seat, but in general, it's been the focus. That's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and that is that is my happy place for sure. Um, you know, if I'm not crafting or doing something, I also really enjoy uh, watercolors, um, painting. Um, I'm a huge uh, children's book, children's uh, literature fan, so I love looking at. Uh, you know, children's picture books and getting ideas from, from those color palettes and things like that. So crafting and creating, I do believe it's, it's part of who I am. And if I don't do it, then I get very cranky. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's interesting because that's, you know, that happens every now and then, because most of the time when I talk to people, they are fairly well focused on one thing or another. Um, but then I have had uh, talked to people like you, where it's the making and the creating, and you're not necessarily locked in on one technique or one particular thing. It's it's to do something with your hands and get those ideas out of your head. Yes. And I often wish that I could choose one, one craft and just focus on that. My husband absolutely <laughs> would like me to do that. Um, <laughs> Cause I can't tell you how many times he's had to move me and things and all of that. And, uh, but I would have a really hard time choosing. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. The thing that I like about the wool applique is it's, it's like building a puzzle. You know, you start with this base and you just cut out pieces and you build them to create this beautiful picture. And then you stitch it down into place um, and it doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, the, the more imperfect and wonky it is, I think the better it looks and the more authentic it looks. Um, so. Well, that's the thing that I have. I mean, obviously, you're not the first person's wool applique that I've looked at. But that's the thing that I've found so often is there seems to, at least to me, to be a fine line between just really average kind of thrown together look. And then that that uh, creative, imprecise, but really nice, pleasing look. I don't know. I can't. When I was putting together questions for us to talk about, I, w I sat for a good 10 minutes trying to describe to you what that is. Because there seems to be a, a dividing line in that kind of, of, in, in that kind of work, that kind of creative work, where it really looks good. But then if you're on the other side of that, it just doesn't quite measure up. And I don't know what that is. Well, I think that there's different styles of it. And, and certainly there's the very, very primitive look where, you know, you don't do a buttonhole stitch. You just do a whip stitch to make it look like it's tacked down. Um, but there's also wool applique that is very finely detailed. You know, like, you know, they've cut out the tiniest little... Um, you know, the branch on a tree comes to a direct point and it's it's tacked down with a buttonhole stitch to make it look like it's completely edged. Um, so you can run the gamut. I mean, there's, you know, that, like I said, that very primitive look um, to the very detailed and, and finished look. Yeah. Um, I would say my work kind of falls right in the middle. Um, you know, my style never 
what comes out is never what I envision when I put my design down. I would like my look to look more primitive than it does. I always say my style is kind of like cartoonish and it, that's not what I want it to be. Um, but other people seem to like it. So we kind of go with that. And I've tried to change my style and it, it always kind of pulls back to it is what it is. This is who you are. So right. just stick with it. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say cartoonish and I hate the word whimsy, but there is a, an element of that in there. Yeah. But yeah. it has a, it has a very finished look to it. Um, because some, sometimes I think, and this, you know, this is just my opinion. I'm probably going to make 50,000 people mad. But uh, sometimes I think that, that uh, the label folk art mm -hmm. uh, gives people a license to be, uh, these are bad words to use, but a license to be sloppy is, is the way it strikes me or careless. And, uh, and so it bothers me because when I see really good folk art, it's like, wow, that uh, nailed it. Thank you. Um, but see, and I don't see any of that in yours. I really, your, yours has a real finish to it. Uh, but there's, there's obviously flexibility in what you do. It's, it's, it's interesting. I, I <laughs> you owe me a couple hours <laughs> of my life, but, <laughs> but I just, you know, I just, it's interesting to study what, uh, any of the people I talk to, but uh, I did it with you too. You know, study your work. I mean, I just sit there and look at and try and, and see what you're doing with it. And, and there is definitely a style. There's no question. There's a style and, uh, and it, and it works. And, but there's that, 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 uh, flexibility within it that really makes it fun. I think. Yes. Yes. And I've, I mean, like I said, I experiment with it a lot. Um, one thing that I've been told over and over because I teach wool applique classes at a local quilt store that we have. And one thing that people constantly tell me, and I guess I can see it when I look is that, you know, my stitches, they always ask like, do you use a ruler? Do you, you know, do, how do you get them <laughs> so consistent? And I just say to them, you know, I literally could do the blanket stitch in my sleep because I, you know, that muscle memory just, yep. you know, I don't even have to think about what I'm doing. It just, it just happens. And I tell them, you know, it doesn't matter when you do wool applique, if your stitches are an inch apart, that's fantastic, but just make sure they're an inch apart throughout your entire piece. That's what's going to make it look finished and look like it all meshes together. It's when you have those inconsistent stitches um, that, like you said, it looks messy and it gets sloppy looking like you haven't really taken the time. So, you know, when we teach, the, when I teach the classes, we practice, we practice on, you know, material that I brought so that people can get consistent. I teach them little tricks for how to get consistency when they're stitching without, you know, holding a ruler up to their work. So, right. um, yeah. And see, and that's the thing, of course, that's in any of that uh, kind of, of design work, those stitches, that blanket stitch, that's the visual thing that you, you tend to lock in on. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and that was one thing that I, I was studying with yours. And there is a very consistent precision to that all the way around to the point where it becomes a positive design element, but also doesn't dominate the piece. It, it, right. it, it integrates with it. And that's what I enjoyed about it, where if it starts to get a little off, then your mind keeps wanting to go to, well, that isn't quite measure. That isn't the same as that one. And, and it takes away from the overall art and, Right. And you can kind of decide on that when you're, when you're making the design or when you're, even if it's a kit that somebody else has put together, you can decide, do you want the focus to be on the wool and the, the actual design and picture, in which case you would choose floss that matches the wool. So it kind of blends into what the wool is, or if you want the stitching to be um, the primary focus then you choose a contrasting thread so that it pops off of the wool and you can see that much more. So you decide whether you want it to blend or whether you want it to pop when you're making your color choices for the floss that you choose. Yeah. Now, so this, this kind of, of creativity, this kind of art, this needle art, this, this gives you in your mind, it's the, the mind of the designer is what intrigues me where you said that the, the quilting where the points have to match up and, you know, and that, that whole world of things, uh, you, your mind, your design mind needs, needs some gray area to expand into or stay away from. 
Yeah, most of the time when I get my ideas, it's because I've looked at something and I've seen it incorrectly. You know, like I'll glance at something and then when I look again, it's not what I thought. But then the the image that stays in my head is the the mistake that I saw. And I think, oh, well, that's interesting. Let's put that down. So for instance, the the series that I'm doing now called The Wing of the Crow, which is a seasonal wool applique where you know these images are in this ginormous crow. Um, I saw that, that was actually a cross stitch pattern where somebody had taken um, a crow, like a silhouette of a crow, and they had um, put some quilt blocks, you know, cross stitch some quilt block patterns. I think it was like an Ohio star or something within the wing of the crow and I thought oh that's really cool what about if I did something like seasonal in the whole body of the crow Mm -hmm. Um, and then it just kind of and actually what I was thinking was fall because crows and fall and pumpkins and fall colors they all kind of go together and then I thought oh well what could I do for winter and then I thought oh well what about spring and then before I knew it I had four a series you know a four um and so it just kind of went from there. <laughs> you see, that's the thing. You know, Beth Ellicott and I were talking about this in, in a recent uh, Wednesday show when we were talking about creativity. And, and you just used that phrase, that what if. I see this, but what if? Mm-hmm. What if I go off here and do this and see what happens? And uh, so you don't have, see, this is what's fun, is you don't have those mental barriers that I have uh, your mind just says, well, let me just go over here and see what happens. And that's yes. where I have trouble. And that's one of my favorite things to do. And it drives my mother insane because I will start something and I'll do it just to see if I can do it. You know, I'll have this image in my mind. I'll have this idea and I just go with it until it's done. And then I think, okay, I can do it. I did it. I'm done with that. Let's, let's what's the next thing? Um, the, the women who were at my wool applique class, they wanted to learn a whole bunch of embroidery stitches, but they still wanted to do their wool applique. And, you know, they said just doing a stitch every once in a while when you need it isn't enough to lock it into your muscle memory. And I said, well, let me come up with a, a design that we work on for a full year. And each design element that we do is going to force you to practice something other than the blanket stitch. So we did a block a month where it was, uh, it ended up being a flower, a floral quilt. And um, each month the block had at least five different kinds of stitches. So it might've been, you know, the simple, like a French knot or a running stick stitch or a back stitch. There were some fancy stitches, um, But the more they did it, the more they could do it automatically. So sometimes other people's wants or needs have kind of driven me to design something that would meet those needs. Um, And that was that's actually a series that design is running right now. It's a a year long projects that are running in uh, Woolworks magazine right now. Uh Um, Yeah, she picked it up. So and that all came out of ladies wanting to do practice the stitch more yep they wanted to practice the stitch more and they wanted like i said to not have it be like oh i've got to look it up online or i've got to look it up in this stitch book that i have when i need to do it they wanted it to be you know a muscle memory thing where they didn't have to think about okay the needle comes up here i need to do this they wanted to just to be able to do it so and and it worked well and we did we did it we finished it was like a little quilt top in wool applique Um, at the end of the year, they had it all done. (laughs) That's neat. And there's, there's your, if you really want to learn something, teach it. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You learn as much from the students as as they learn from you. Yep. Yeah. (laughs) So the, um, are you one of those people that has ideas in your head all the time that just have to get out? Or are you a more linear person where I see an idea, I execute it? Uh, No, my head, no one would want to live inside of my head. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) My brain, my brain never, never shuts down. Yeah. Um, I, my mind is constantly going. I constantly have, you know, 
20 different projects going. If I don't have several projects going at one time, I real I feel anxiety. And most people can't function like that. I can't function unless I have several different things to choose from to work on and do. And just just one or the other depending on the moment. Yeah, and right so right now I'm in the process of um, designing. I just finished the third crow series, the spring crow. Um, I'm working on a suffragist pattern that I really want to get out to the world by August 19th, which is the date of uh, the women's vote. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I have so many things going on right now and I love them all, you know, I, so I work on them all and, it's really hard to shut my brain down. That's why I drink. I drink a lot of coffee, <laughs> so I have enough energy to do it all. Oh, I see. You, uh, you use use the drug to get you what you want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there an art background there, or is this just you? No, no, I don't. I have no art background. I have no sewing background. Um, I took one art class in high school. I took one sewing class in middle school. I'm primarily self-taught. Um, like I said, my mom was constantly doing crafts. So she, you know, she taught me a lot of, of what I know. Um, but I've taught myself how to do a lot through a lot of trial and error, um, and just learning, learning new things. And that's the thing that keeps me going is I have kind of like this insatiable need and desire to learn new things all the time, you know, and it doesn't just have to be about stitching and wool. Like I, I'm really passionate, like I said, about children's literature, so I'm very involved in that world. I'm the president of our local um, reading council for teachers in my county. Um, I am passionate about women's history and just can't get enough of learning about that. I'm actually looking into like the history of wool and and pioneer women who had that, you know, um, even though they had zero amount of time, they still wanted to make beautiful things for their home. And that's why wool applique came to be, you know, they would use up all of the old clothing and things. So the history of wool applique intrigues me. Um, so yeah. So can you tell like where my mind goes? <laughs> yep. It's yep. all over the place. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah. No. And, and I, I relate to that because I, I am of the same mind in terms of always wanting to learn things. And uh, my my poor wife, you know, forty five years of of one thing after another. But uh, but it's the it it is the the learning that is the fun part and the exploring new things. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. The um. Uh, the company under the wool and willow. W when does that start? How does that? Uh, come to be and so and now now that i know i did not know you had that store so you already had a serious background in developing this kind of a business right so my my store before it was a brick and mortar we had no we had no online presence when it was uh, a brick and mortar and it, that was actually called the crafter's cottage and then when we moved into the big brick building it was the crafter's cottage and old schoolhouse gifts because it was an old schoolhouse that we moved into um, but then, like I said, I got away from it when I started teaching full time in, in meaning that I didn't sell my things. I was still certainly creating, but I just wasn't selling. And then, um, about a year or two ago, I, I start, well, you know, a year or two ago, let's be honest, I turned 50 and, um, and you're okay. I don't, I don't, you made I'm it. okay. <laughs> I'm really okay with that. Um, in fact, I forget how old I am. My husband has to remind me, so it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I didn't, I wouldn't, I don't want to call it a midlife crisis. But there's a there's a quote from Brene Brown that I'm going to paraphrase because I think hers had a few swear words in it. But it was basically something that said like, use your God given talents and share them with the world because you will not be here forever. Like that was the gist of the message, and that that hit me hard, you know, like I'm not getting a lot of satisfaction out of what I'm doing in my nine to five, but I get a whole lot of satisfaction when I go and teach my classes and when I'm creating things on my own. So 
I decided that I wasn't going to open another brick and mortar because that was a lot of, you know, it was a lot of time running the actual store. Right. Um, but so I opened my Etsy shop and I live on a road that has the word willow in it. I have my entire life. I just basically moved down the street when I left my mom's home and, um, I wanted the word willow to be in it because that was, that was where my roots were. Um, so that's where under the woolen willow, cause I had to get the word wool in there too. Right, right. Um, so that's how that came to be. And so I opened an Etsy shop a, a couple of years ago and it really wasn't until COVID hit that I've had the time to do what I've always wanted to do with it, which is develop it and market it and actually get things into the shop on a consistent basis. And then my ultimate goal is to design. You know, I want to make that transition from only making things to designing it and kitting things up. And my goal would be to be a vendor at like quilt shows, but that's on hold right now. Right. You know, I yeah. want to get I want to get my things out into the world. Um, and I'm I'm waiting until the fourth book is out before I start contacting stores to see if they're interested in carrying my patterns um, and my booklets. But that's that's where we're heading. That's where we're going. So so for right now, the my designs are available in my Etsy shop, um, but hopefully someday they'll be sitting in other people's shops. As yeah, well. well, let's hope that happens. That's the yeah, and, and this is it's just terrible that a thing like COVID. It has to happen. I mean, none of us wants anything to do with it. But uh, for the needlework world, it's been it's been a real plus for an awful lot of people. It's, a lot of stores have been very busy because people have had time. But then yeah. here, here you're an example of someone who has finally now had an opportunity to do what you've been trying to get to for a while. And mm -hmm. Yeah, when the world was open, I was busy, very busy, you know, every day after school busy, committees, meetings, this, that, and the other thing. And then it all stopped. And so it allowed me the time to, you know, gather my thoughts, get them on paper, start typing, you know, start making the models, which I never would have had time for. Right. Um, you know. <laughs> yeah. that it, it stops. And for a few days anyway, I think everybody was just kind of, wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh and then, then the lights start going on. Oh, I I have some time. I can do this yes. and I can do that. Let's go. And yeah, uh, yep, yeah. takes off. Yep, yeah. No, it's um, uh, tragic that we have to do it this way, but uh, it has opened a lot of doors for a lot of people, and mm -hmm. it's um, yeah, it's a real plus. Yeah. So tell me about. Well, let's see. I don't know what I want. I, I, so many things. Let's just talk about your design work. So we've got this wing of the crow. You've got four books for four seasons. Well played there. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so so we have two out: autumn and winter. Mm -hmm. And and now it, it's this crow and what we do with that. But then you also, if you if you buy the book, you also have uh, guidance or patterns to do some small things too. Right. Because I was, when I designed the pattern, I was kind of also thinking as a consumer, you know, like if I walked into a store and I saw this, the crow is pretty big. She's 24 by 36, each one of them. Mm. And I thought there are going to be people who are going to look at that and think, I don't have room for that. So what I did was I took the design elements that are within the crow and I made smaller projects. So the crow I would not say that that would be a good beginner's project. However, the smaller projects that are in the book are good beginner's project, and they use the same exact pattern pieces that the crow does. So each book has the big, the main crow feature. There are three small um, designs. So in the fall one, there's a small little autumn sign. There's a little pillow, um, and then there's a, a larger, like, a uh, decorative pillow that have all the same designs. The spring crow that's coming out will have a candle wrap. There'll be another small little pillow. I think I did a small little pillow in each one so that if you did all four, you could put them all like in a little basket and you'd have the seasons. Um, so I tried to do that. And then I'm also designing a fifth project for each 
book that will be a bonus pattern that will only be available to shops who sell mm -hmm. my books. So, you know, I, I try to think like, if I go into a store, what would I like to see? You know, what would make me want to purchase this? What would make it enticing for the store owners to carry it? Um, so, you know, again, one of the things that has spurred me along is the, the opportunity to watch other designers on floss tube channels to see the kinds of things that they do and the kinds of things that they think about. So, you know, the stitching community has helped me immensely, even though it's not cross stitch that I'm doing, you know, I'm right. doing a little applique, but you know, the design approaches, um, is still the same. And it's been, it's been fascinating for me to learn and do all of this stuff. One of the things that I picked up in looking at your work was a real, opportunity, orientation, struggling with words today, um, to create these things f that uh, help decorate the home and, yes. and decorate not in a hang this on the wall and leave it there and forget about it, but have a, a fluid decoration process uh, that really has a cohesiveness to it. Right? Wrong? Yeah. Completely no, no, smoking no. Absolutely. Dope here. What am I nope. Doing? <laughs> nope. No. And I think, again, in the times that we're in right now, home has become pretty important for many, many people. And that, you know, I mean, how you, how you want your home to look, how you want your home to feel. Um, you know, I have, I have creations, not mine, mind you, but I have creations all over my house because I want my house to be my safe place. I want it to be my happy place. I want it to feel cozy and comfortable. And so the designs I hope that I do um, will provide other people with that same feeling. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So, yeah. you know, the color palettes that I use, I like very soft and subtle, calming colors. Um, you know, even though I've experimented with brighter colors, I also know that's pushing me outside of my boundaries that, you know, to use a bright color for me is a challenge, you know, where I go and do it. And then I say, okay, I did that. I'm done. <laughs> I'm good with that. <laughs> well, see, that and was the I thing. Go back to my comfort zone. Yeah. That was the thing. The other part, and you've helped me now gel it in my head was, was your color palette because I, I could see these things being used in a home. And, and I look at it, you know, needleworkers can hang stuff on walls all day long till they run out of space, then build a new room, put up more. Yes. But so many of your things don't belong on walls, but they also fit into a room where I wouldn't walk into the room and go, yo, what's that? Uh, it, it all fits in and creates an atmosphere. And yeah. that, that was the feeling I was getting just as I went through the the different photos of, of the different things. So, okay, then I, I read it right then. All right. Yeah. And it's nice that you pick that up really by just seeing the photos that I have, because that, that is what I try to do. I, you know, I try to do it in my own home. I try to do it in what I make, what my finished work is. And then certainly in the things that I'm designing. So it's really nice that it's working. <laughs> well, it's the read I got out of it because it's, Whenever I look at a designer's work, I, I do spend time because I, I, if you look at it long enough, it starts to gel and you start to see the, the, the technique, the pattern, the, you know, what's in the head kind of thing. And, and it, for you, it was, it, it was, it just kept coming to me. I thought, you know, that really is, there, there's something to this other than just hang it on a wall. And, uh, and so it, it took a little bit for it to come. And then as you were describing things, then it really gelled for me, uh, what, what was happening there. So I, it's just, it's just different and, and it works and, um, yeah. So bravo for that. Great. Thank you. Yeah. The color palette. I mean, there, there's every designer has a set of colors they use and then probably a couple of colors that they just soon burn. But, uh, it, does that come out of your head? Is that? something that is, is just come together over through life experience. Where does that palette come from? I think, I think I would attribute it to life experience and constantly observing what colors work together and what colors don't work together and what is pleasing to me. Um, you know, 
I I steer away from colors that are, like I said, bright and bold. I love them, but I don't use them. You know, I won't use a bright orange color, but I certainly love like the deep pumpkin color. Mm -hmm. So I, I steer more towards the country, primitive, subtle colors, um, you know, not the bright and bolds, but the, the other. And, you know, I just, I, I love color. I love playing with color. I love, you know, looking at different color palettes, looking through magazines, see what colors work together. Um, so Okay, so that's something that's in your head all the time, always looking yes. for that. You know? Yes, yes. And what is it about the primitive? Because that's, I find that that primitive thing fascinating, because it's it's not necessarily what intrigues me, but I admire well done primitive stuff because it has its own statement, and it's there's a real comfort to it visually. I think. I think. Um kind of on a deeper level, I like the history of it. I mm. like thinking that 100, 200 years ago, things were much simpler. You know, people made little dolls for their children to play with. People made pretty things, whoops, people made pretty things for their house. Um, even though, like I said, they didn't have time to do that, but they wanted something pretty. I, I just like the idea of it. And then for the making of it, I love it because it's so forgiving. Mm. You know, if you make a cat that is a little bit a wonky cat, that's okay. <laughs> you know, if you make a flower that doesn't look realistic as a flower, but you can still tell, like I said, making primitive for me, I enjoy it just because it's, it's so forgiving. It's, it doesn't have to be perfect. The more imperfect it is, the better it is. Um, because that's really the history of it. That's the background of it. Mm -hmm. Well, and that fits your mind design wise, where you can yes. take something and then go do something with it. Yes. Take me through a little bit of wool applique. Well, let me, well, yeah, that wool applique. What, uh, what's involved in that? Uh, it looks like it's the, the barrier to entry is pretty low. Mm -hmm. uh, take me through what, if, if I want to start tomorrow with wool applique, what am I looking at as a, a, a startup kit, so to speak? Well, I think like with any other craft or, or needlework, there's many different levels that you can enter in. I mean, you start off with the most basic of supplies, the least expensive of supplies until you know that this is something that you're going to do more of. Um, so you could do wool applique with chenille needles, one, wool felt, which is, less expensive than real wool or the over dyed wools, some freezer paper, some good scissors. And then basically what you do is you have a base cloth or a ground cloth. You have a pattern piece. You trace it out on your freezer paper. Then you iron it onto the wool. You cut it out. You put it down on your ground cloth and then you choose what kind of stitching you want. You can use DMC floss. You can use pearl cotton floss. You could, you could use wool um, floss if you wanted to. It's not necessary. I, I use mostly DMC or pearl cotton. And then you just, you just keep putting your pieces down, stitch them down, and you build the puzzle until your, your design is complete and it's pleasing to you. You can, you can embellish it. You can get as fancy or plain as you want. I've added beads to some of my work. I've added buttons to some of my work. I've, I've added some cottons, I've added trims, um, or you can just have it be wool. It's very inexpensive to get started with. Of course, if you love it, you're going to want to move forward. Here we go. With, it's, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it is very much like cross stitch in that, you know, you can start with a very base wool. There is a wool felt that is, you know, $1.39 a sheet. Um, that works perfectly fine, but then there is over dyed wools that are beautiful that, you know, you stitch through and it's like butter. And once you go, you know, once you go down that road, you don't want to go back. <laughs> so, um, again, you know, but there's a lot of different places that you can enter to try this out to see if it's for you. So that's another benefit to it as well. The thing that I enjoyed, what many things, obviously I enjoyed your work, you know, okay. So let's, that's, that's a given. Um, was I did notice the embellishment part. 
there seem to be we could anybody can make a base and then you can really personalize it so it's like like really like any other kind of needlework where you start with a a basic pattern or project and then you do with it what you want because you just a few buttons here or there or a bow or maybe even a little cross stitch or any number of things that that really enhance the project Yes, um, you. It, it is exactly like cross stitch. If you don't like the color that's being used, you can swap out the colors. If you don't like the floss that's being used, you can you can change it. You can make it yours, um, just like you would with cross stitch or a lot of other a lot of the other needle arts. Because that that was the other part that I started seeing. All right, I'm, I'm going to do wool applique, and. I'm going to embellish. So now I start wanting to collect buttons and <laughs> and other little trinkets and have them in jars because as I make a piece, then I pull out my jars and yes. spread things out on a table and start having some extra fun. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And th and that fits into that whole primitive thing. Save old buttons and Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> in fact, in in the books that I have, I have like the whole history of wool applique and it's, you know, that saying of um you know, make it do or do without, use it up, that, that saying, that, mm -hmm. that, is, that is truly what, what it is all about is, you know, you, in this day and age, we have the benefit of walking into a store and buying beautiful wool and beautiful floss. Um, but back then they didn't, they had, um, you know, they used, literally used pennies and coins to make their circles that they would use. Um, a lot of the old, um, Table runners had what's called tongues that literally look like little tongues that they would put the pennies on, you know, and they, they just used what they had. Make it work, make something pretty out of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. So the wool, now I, I figured that that was the case, that we can get 15 different levels of wool all the way up to ultra, ultra premium. Uh, the really good stuff, hard to come by. No, that, well, there's several online sources. There's a lot of quilt shops that carry wool as part of their, you know, what they what they carry with cotton fabrics. They also have a section for wool. It's not hard to come by. So anybody who wanted to jump on board certainly could find a source. There's several online sources that I use pretty consistently. and And I've gone into... Um, you know, Goodwill, Salvation Army, thrift shops, and I've bought old wool clothes and you bring them home and you rip them apart and you throw <laughs> them in a really hot laundry and a hot dryer and it, and it felts them up really nice and holds them firm so they don't fray and use those, um, those pieces of wool. That so, gives you so kind you of can, a really good. Okay, you uh, can, so with just a little bit of effort, you can get some good wool to work with. Absolutely. <laughs> and and really, it's like everything else, at least in my world, when somebody finds out that I'm doing something, they just keep giving you, hmm. you know, like, oh, can you use this? Can you use this? Can you use this? And I never say no. <laughs> I, <laughs> You know, I take it and eventually I use it. I use it either in my wool class at the quilt shop. I use it in my own things or... You know, sometimes if I'm doing projects with kids at school, we'll use some of the stuff. So it doesn't go to waste. Yeah, as a teacher, that's a real uh, excellent outlet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, teachers are closet hoarders. Yes, they are, especially yes. elementary <laughs> teachers. Yes. Yes. That's a, that's a specialty you have to have. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Now, if I'm, if I'm doing, say, if I go get wool felt at Joann's and uh, compared to really high-quality felt, and is it easier to work with? What's the what's the difference? Is it just look and durability? Um, as I'm putting this together, what am I gaining or losing, or does it not? Is it just a preference thing? Um, no, there there definitely is a difference when you're working with it. Um, you know, I kind of say like the wool felt is a great place to start. It's not difficult to stitch through. It's a little bit harder than when you're stitching through the hand dyed wools like so if the wool felt is kind of like the Volkswagen beetle bug then the hand dyed wool is like the Cadillac mm -hmm. of of materials that you can use and once you start stitching through the beautiful hand dyeds it's really difficult to go back however it's also, if you're making something that you're going to sell, it's not really feasible to always use that really good stuff because you have to mark your items up so 
you know, so much to cover the cost of your materials that sometimes for economy's sake, you can get the same effect with the the um, the lesser expensive wool felt and people, you know, can it's much more affordable for them. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically, if you're just doing it for yourself, it's the, the equivalent of cotton versus silk thread. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. OK, I get the picture. <laughs> yeah. Or or Ada versus linen. Like there's nothing wrong with either one. It's right. just, you know, your preference of of ease of working and right yeah, yeah. they all they all have the same <laughs> the same thing it's just yeah the you same know, it's levels the same, yep yep <laughs> totally different entry points and again i wouldn't you know i wouldn't go out and and do my 24 by 36 crow as a beginner thing and go out and buy top of the line everything until you know that you're going to like it like doing it that you're going to do more of it um, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's you know, it's the beauty, really, of this, or as you describe it, uh, or any other needlework. The 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 entry barrier is extremely low. A, a needle, mm -hmm. some thread, and a piece of cloth, and you can do something. Yes. And yes. Uh, uh, this is really no different than that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Michelle, thank you. That was You're fun. You're welcome. Thanks for having things. me. things. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> okay, so the Etsy shop. And then uh, um, books, so we have book, the Crow Book 1, which is autumn. Book 2 is winter. Then 3 and 4 are going to be obviously spring and summer. When are those going to show up? They um, actually, yeah. My <laughs> son is a graphic designer, so he's the guy putting it all together. Like, he's the guy who's making my work look like it's professional. Um, so he's actually coming tomorrow, and we're, we're getting spring ready to go to the printer. All the models are done. And then my goal is to have Summer Crow out by the end of summer. So beginning of September, all four will be out. And in between there, I want to get the suffragist pattern out. Um, in the meantime, people can purchase Woolworks Magazine. has uh, my year-long design in it if they want to learn a bunch of different stitches at the same time learning wool applique. Um, that's been running all year. Um, and I have lots of different designs in my head that I just need to get down on paper and get them stitched. All right. Well, we'll look for all of that. Thanks, Michelle. And Great. Thank you, Gary. Thanks to everybody for listening.